it's Seraphin, and today I'm going to show you what is HDR, why we need it, and how to do it. So what is HDR? Well, HDR stands for High Dynamic Range, or a high ratio between the darkest and lightest areas in an image. Uh, the term HDR also refers to high dynamic range imaging, a photography technique that takes a series of images, usually ranging from 3 to 9 images, and each of them with a different exposure. So you capture the scenery from underexposed to overexposed. It then combines the best part of these images to create a dramatic one with a greater dynamic range of luminosity than what standard cameras or photographic techniques could deliver. So why do we need HDR? And if you've spent long enough in photography, you're probably always struggling with a camera's dynamic range of luminosity. And the root of that problem is that, as of today, even the best camera with the most advanced built-in processors cannot outperform the human eye and our brain when it comes to rendering the dynamic range that we see. Because the human eyes constantly adjust to the broad dynamic changes of luminosity in our environment. Light information is caught through the iris, intercepted by the photoreceptor cells, the, the conan rod cells in the retina and passed on to our brain. Our brain almost instantaneously and continuously interpret this information so that most of us can adapt to seeing a high ratio of the darkest to lightest values. Most cameras simply cannot do that. I'm going to show you how to do HDR in desktop environments, but first let's get down to some technical data to better understand HDR. Our dynamic vision processed by our brains can easily differentiate between the lightest and darkest area with a ratio of about 100,000 to 1. Now 100,000 is 2 to the power of 16.61 and 1 is 2 to the power of 0. So the powers of 2 that range from 0 to 16.61 are commonly used in photography under the terms of stops or exposure values, EVs. Let's take a look at the images we take with our cameras. If you capture an image in a JPEG format with its 8-bit per color channel, the highest dynamic range will be 2 to the 8, which is only 256 to 1, an EV of only 8, and about 1 out of 400 the dynamic range of our eyesight. The best professional camera in the market has an EV of 14.8 if the image is in RAW format, which makes it have a dynamic range of 28,526 to 1, or about 1 over 3.5 the dynamic range of our eyesight. However, in day-to-day -day practice, it is very hard to achieve the ideal exposure value of, of a digital camera that was tested in a controlled lab. Uh, the camera EV in daily use is about 3 to 4 stops below the ideal number published. So what can we learn from these facts? First of all, we obviously need more than one image to achieve the result that resembles the high dynamic range of our eyesight. For practical consideration, you need one balanced image for reference, one overexposed image to get the details in the darkest area, and one underexposed image for the details in the brightest areas. So you need at least three images, and also from our above discussion, you'll get better results if you use the raw format. So let's get down to the practical side of HDR photography. What do you need to do HDR? Any camera that can support manual exposure and shutter speed settings can be used to capture images for HDR, but to get the best results, you need a camera that supports bracket shots, raw formats, and you need a sturdy tripod. Okay, if you have everything you need, start by putting the camera on the tripod, then set your camera to manual mode, or if you are not that comfortable with manual mode, you can set it to aperture priority mode, uh, AV mode in Canon, A mode in Nikon. Open up the menu tab and set your camera to bracket mode. Normally you can get a reasonably good result with three images, one for the current scene, two stops down for the underexposed, and two stops up for the overexposed. And it's also best to use a remote trigger or set a two second timer to avoid unnecessary camera shake. Then just start shooting! So now that you have your images, just select all of them and drag them to Photoshop. This opens up the camera raw and we're actually going to be doing our HDR here using the very simple HDR menu 
and it's actually very new and very simple. Uh, started in camera row 9. So make sure you've selected them all and then click right and merge to HDR here or all them. Okay. And here we have some options and make sure you select these two options here, they're very important. And here we have deghost and what deghost does is um, it stops ghosting. And what ghosting is, uh, is since HDR is more than one image and when you try to merge them if one of the things have moved, for example this cloud here or this person here, what you get is sort of a ghosty sort of look. That's not what you want so make sure you switch on deghost and if you click show overlay, overlay here, um, you can see where the ghosting has happened, all over here. So, okay. And now just click Merge. And just save it and just, I'm just gonna leave the name be. Save. Most HDR software combine these images into a single 32-bit file, which technically surpasses our eyesight in normal circumstances, but there are also software that process the raw images into a single 8 or 16-bit file. Um, since most displays can only show 8-bit color channels, the file needs to be compressed into 8 bits, and a process and this is a process that is called tone mapping. And most of the time you spend in HDR post-processing is in getting the right tone mapping so that the end result looks exactly like what you originally saw. And failure to do that or overdoing it well, the results become too unrealistic and over the top. Okay, so it's done. And now what I'm gonna do is, I'm not gonna do much really, but if we zoom in on the sky, I think, yeah, it looks kind of not black. So I'm gonna lower the shadows a little bit, just until it looks right, just a little bit. Okay, back to view, and here we can see these small blue dots. So I'm going to zoom in there. And if you want to know more about the camera raw post-processing, you can check out my other video in the link below. So I'm just going to do this a little bit. Okay, just until they vanish. Back there, and up the vibrance too. Okay, I think that's good, so I'm going to open object. I'm going to make a copy of my layer now, okay? I'm going to rasterize it, and I'm also going to rename it Base. Okay, now I'm going to solve this small problem I see, and here it is. It's sort of like weird black shape. And it's caused by something went wrong during the merging process, probably some sort of ghosting. And you can easily solve this by going to Lasso Tool. Just select the edges here. We're gonna blend it in using the Gaussian Blur. Okay, roughly 41.5, that's good. Okay, and just select the other side now. Okay, go to Filter and oh, Gaussian Blur. Okay. So now I'm going to sharpen it using a new technique and Control J twice. Rename the bottom one Blur. And this technique is very similar to um, frequency separation, down to the names. And in the Blur tab, I'll switch off the this one. Go to Filter, Blur, and instead of Gaussian Blur, Surface Blur. Just blur it enough so that the surfaces are blurred but that you can still see the boundaries. Okay, so this looks pretty good. I'm gonna click OK. Okay, now go to Texture, switch off the uh, visibility, go to Image, Apply Image, and make sure you click this layer, the blur layer. Okay, and make sure the blending mode is subtract, subtract. Everything is uh, automatically generated, and click OK. Then change the blending mode from Normal to Vivid Light. And now get rid of the blur light because that's negating the effects. Sorry. Okay. And now we can see this is really too harsh. And I only want it blurred in a I only want it sharpened in a specific few areas. So I'm gonna apply a layer mask to that. So Alt to 
to make the layer mask black. Go to brush, make sure you're painting in white, click exit and change it. And make sure the flow is lowered, you don't want anything too drastic. And I'm going to paint over the rocks here. Okay. I think I'm going to up the flow just a little bit. Alright, I'm going to do the clouds too. So just a little bit of the video here. Like this, down, down, down. Okay. So let's see the before and after. Quite subtle, but you can really see it in the rocks and also the clouds here. All right. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to sort of replicate the sun shining down on the rocks here. Okay, so I'm gonna go to adjustment layer then to curves, you know, a little bit, just a little bit. Go to red, I'm gonna make it warmer and split up. Then I'm gonna go to blue and emphasize that by lowering the blues. Right, that looks pretty nice. So, okay. It's too dramatic, so I'm just gonna inverse the layer mask. And then I'm going to paint over the areas that I want to be looking more like warmer. Quite a subtle effect. Again, make sure the flow is lowered like this. Maybe just a little bit more. Okay. Don't want it to be too harsh. Just a little bit here. Everywhere that the sun touched. Just a little bit on the roof. Okay, so let's see before and after. You can see a pretty big difference, even though it's very subtle. That's what we want. Okay, so. And last of all, I'm going to apply another adjustment layer. I'm going to photo filter. I'm going to do from warming filter to the cooling filter LBB here. Okay. Go back to layers. And this is also too harsh, so I'm going to turn the inverse layer mask. And instead of using a brush, I'm going to go to the gradient filter, here. And make sure it's in white. Just dry it down like that. Okay, be very careful with this. And as you can see, this is way too harsh. So go back to brush and make sure you're painting in black. And up the size to a little bit. And just paint slowly. Make sure it blends in properly. And okay, so I think this looks pretty good. And that's it for today, and thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.